Good afternoon. Delighted to have you all here. Uh, I'm Jane Harmon, uh, President and CEO of the Wilson Center, and I've come to welcome you and to say hello to a dear friend, uh, Wolfgang Insinger. Uh, the Wilson Center, unlike uh, monuments or statues on the Mall, is the living memorial to our 28th president, who was our only PhD president. How many of you knew that? That's pretty good. Ambassador Issinger, did you know that? No. He didn't know that. No. All right. Our charter forbids us from advocacy, uh, but not from creating what we call a safe political space to engage a diversity of views and to explore today's toughest policy issues. Although President Wilson's 14 points were not adopted as he envisioned during his lifetime, his call to remove economic barriers and build an association of nations in Europe was eventually realized through the European Union. The current debt crisis, no one would miss this, is the greatest challenge the EU has faced since its inception. Uh, but the road to creating a union, free and at peace, was never an easy one. That the EU has become what it is today is a testament to the passionate and hard work of top diplomats like today's speaker, uh, my dear friend, Ambassador Wolfgang Issinger. Uh, he was Germany's ambassador to London from 2006 uh, to 2008, and to the United States from 2001 uh, to 2006. Those were very quiet years for U.S. foreign policy. I thought I would mention that. And U.S.-German U.S. relations at an all-time, uh, well, not an all-time low, but, it, but they, U.S.-German relations uh, were, were quite strained during that period. His many accomplishments include helping to negotiate the Dayton Peace Accords in Bosnia and representing the EU in the Troika, made up of the EU, the US, and Russia during the negotiations on the future of Kosovo. And the, uh, the uh, Kosovar ambassador is here, I'm told, right there. And oh, by the way, I'm headed to Kosovo this Wednesday uh, when uh, President Yayaga is having a big forum on, on uh, women and security and the rule of law on Friday. So I'm, or Thursday, Thursday and Friday, and I'm, I'm going there to um, see your country. It's one of the places I haven't been, and to join her. And she has become uh, a great partner of the Wilson Center on a lot of our activities, so I'm very, very excited. Um, during the years he served as ambassador, Wolfgang Essinger kept uh, turning up at all the national security forums where I was. Um, no, he wasn't a stalker. The point was that both of us were keenly interested in how we might address the, the toughest issues. I was then a member of our Congress, served there for nine terms, and uh, was in the, the tough fights um, that he was in, too, about not just our bilateral relationships, but, but how to chart a course in the post 9-11 world. We're still learning our way. I think it's fair to say that Europe is still in its way. And oh, by the way, the challenges are still out there. Um, I know that uh, from my experience as ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee, where I served for eight years, that in order to cooperate effectively with our transatlantic partners, it's essential that we create opportunities to interact with each other. Uh, a fantastic forum for doing that is the annual Munich Security Forum, uh, which I know uh, Wolfgang participated in over the years, but now he, he heads it. Uh, and I am uh, uh, about to go for the 12th time, I think, I, maybe I've lost count, uh, to the Security Forum. I think it is a magnificent place, Munich is, but also a magnificent setting uh, and an event that brings together the top uh, defense and national security strategists and leaders in the world. It's become a, uh, some of the topics are, are, are even broader now, but when it was a boutique national security and defense forum, still my favorite way to do it, uh, the leaders uh, and the thinkers uh, all over the world came to that. And so I uh, look forward to my trip in February. Uh, look forward to Ambassador Issinger's comments now uh, at this director's forum. And following his comments, Christian Osterman, who directs our Europe project and also our Cold War Archives project, uh, will moderate a discussion with all of you. Um, that's the point of this, is to have a conversation with a great leader. So please welcome a great leader and a great friend, Wolfgang Issinger.
Thank you so much, uh, Jane, for for inviting me and, and for welcoming me uh, here today. Uh, I think it's now been practically 30 years since my first uh, contact with the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, I was a young diplomat in Washington, and I, 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 I believe I remember the occasion was a visit to Washington by then Chancellor Helmut Schmidt, who is now 93, still alive and having strong opinions, and uh, he had strong opinions then, both about Jimmy Carter and about incoming President Ronald Reagan. Uh, uh, those were interesting times. So it's, it's great to be back, and thank you, uh, Jane, for, for inviting me. Um, and uh, uh, let me say how grateful I am to you personally and to many of your colleagues, former colleagues, current colleagues, who have made the Munich Security Conference such uh, a relevant transatlantic event. Uh, I don't know of many other conferences of this type which bring together uh, so many high-ranking people from Europe, but also such an interesting um, number of senior congressional leaders from both uh, the Senate and the House. That makes it special and, and particularly attractive to many Europeans uh, who come to Munich not to listen to me, but to be in touch with these uh, American political leaders. Uh, I'm going to try to say a few words each about uh, in the time allotted to me, about Europe, the EU, the Eurozone, about Germany in particular, and thirdly, about the transatlantic relationship and what some of these developments mean or may mean in the future. Um, one of the great difficulties in diplomacy, as I believe I've learned over the last three or four decades, is to understand what it is that you're looking at. Sometimes you believe that you know what you're looking at, but it takes sometimes a special effort. And the best way of describing this is by way of the story of what happened to Pope Benedict. Uh, during his one of his recent visits to his home country, Germany. And I don't, I can't really promise to you that this is a true story, but it is a story from which everyone can learn something. So I'll share it with you. It only takes a minute. Benedict was in Munich, and then he was invited to sit in this fancy BMW limousine um, and they invited him to ride in this new car to his next event in, I believe it was Stuttgart, a hundred miles away. And the young driver uh, left Munich and got onto the Autobahn, at which point the Pope leaned forward and said, young man, uh, you probably know that when I was Archbishop here in Munich, I used to drive my own car. In Rome, they don't let me drive my car anymore. And in fact, I've never driven one of these 12-cylinder BMWs. Would you mind, you know, uh, and the young man says, uh, Your Holiness, uh, certainly, and he pulls over and modestly gets into the back, back seat, and the Pope gets behind the wheel and drives off. Some of you will be aware that in 2012, even in Germany, there are speed limits occasionally, even on the Autobahn. And so, sure enough, after 15 minutes, the Pope hits uh, one of these w speed traps and is stopped by the Bavarian state police. A young man walks up to the car, looks inside, and then he decides to call his chief. The chief, I caught this guy who was clearly speeding, but it seems to me that this is a VIP situation. Uh, do you think I should actually issue a, 
a, a, a ticket. The chief says, you must have slept in the police academy. In Germany, everybody is equal before the law, so go right ahead. I don't care who this is in the car. The young man looks into the car again. Then he calls his chief once more and says, chief, before I make a big mistake, <laughs> uh, I just want to check with you again. You, you're sure I should give him a ticket? I really think this is a very important person. So the, the chief gets very angry on the phone and says, but who is this famous person in the car? Uh, and the young man says, chief, that's the problem. I don't know who he is. What I do know is his driver is the pope. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it is important to know what it is that you're looking at. Are you looking at uh, catastrophe or are you looking at uh, just one of many crises or are you maybe looking at um, uh, an opportunity arising from crisis. I think that's part of our theme. And that takes me right to my, to my first point. Um, I don't want to be uh, glazing over, I, want to be, I don't want to be misunderstood by, by trying to glaze over or, 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 or ignore uh, the obvious huge difficulties we are currently facing in the EU and more specifically in the Eurozone. But I'm, I must tell you that I, I'm not the only one who has become uh, sick and tired, if I can be frank, with those who have been predicting now with permanent uh, lack of success in their predictions the immediate demise of the Eurozone. I was at a, at a huge conference in this country in May where famous professors from Harvard and, uh, and, and, and uh, well-known economists predicted that before the end of the summer it would all be over and the whole construction would collapse and it would be the biggest thing since the Great Depression of, nine, of the early 30s. Well, that hasn't happened. And I'm not arguing, I'm not an economist myself, I'm not arguing that the arguments which have been advanced are wrong. I admit, again, that we have huge difficulties. But I also believe that those who are not living in the Eurozone, who are not directly participating in our debate, need to be told and need to understand that this is not just a question of economic recovery. This is the political and social and military um, and historical future of Europe. This is, this is a package deal. This is a lot more than just a, an, a, a financial recovery program that is maybe going well or, or, or not so well. Um, I understand the concerns in this country. I understand that the Obama administration has sent Tim Geithner over uh, I don't know how many times to, to keep pushing the Eurozone members, and in particular my own government, the, uh, the German government, to do more. And I also understand that some people are saying if you don't uh, get your act together, you will all look like one big Switzerland. Now, Switzerland, if you leave out, you know, uh, the hoarding of money in Swiss banks, uh, uh, as if you leave that aside, Switzerland isn't such a bad place. <laughs> uh, uh, but I do understand that um, we cannot be, we must not be, uh, a kind of a large Switzerland. We cannot abandon a, a, a role that uh, is more than just European housekeeping. We have to be, um, we have to grow up and, and behave like adults. Um, but I strongly believe that 
the entire history of the European Union is a history of a succession of crises, um, and the European Union has consistently, over the last 30 or 40 years, been able to move forward only because of some crises or another. I remember myself uh, from the days when I was a young diplomat, when Maggie Thatcher said, I want my money back. And it was a huge crisis because no one knew how we would resolve it. I remember, and you will all remember, uh, just a few years ago, that the referenda in France and in other European countries failed on the, on the, on the constitutional treaty. And, and we seem to be, you know, driving this engine against a brick wall. Well, things continued anyway. And uh, we came out of these um, uh, various uh, crises always doing just a little bit better. So my simple message, number one, is that I strongly believe uh, that changing the EU in the direction of more and more effective integration of the Eurozone in particular has already started. Uh, it is sometimes being ignored by the commentariat, but there is already now more integration. I, you will see by the end of this year that in two successive uh, EU summit meetings, one in October, one in December, um, fiscal uh, discipline um, and steps toward uh, the so-called banking union will be undertaken. Um, I have I've heard many times uh, that we are doing, and that Chancellor Merkel, uh, whose spokesman I am not, uh, that she is doing only the minimum necessary and that it, is, it, it, it all sums up to too little, too late, instead of decisive action, moving forward, et cetera. Well, let me tell you that uh, it is, our motto is no longer just the minimum necessary. The motto is now Mr. Draghi's, chairman of the ECB, Mr. Draghi's sentence, we will do whatever it takes. That is the principle. And maybe I should add, so that you understand how far-reaching this, this is, that as a consequence of the developments of this last summer, uh, some interesting things have happened in the EU. The Bundesbank used to play in the uh, play of forces uh, in the EU, in the Eurozone, of course, a key role because it's the bank of the strongest country in the Eurozone. The Bundesbank has now, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry to say this to my friend Jens Weidmann, has been marginalized. Uh, the president of the Bundesbank keeps arguing that this is not right, we shouldn't do it. He warns of, uh, and I understand the good reasons he has for warning, but he is alone. And even the German chancellor uh, has decided to support Chairman Draghi's decision to say we'll do whatever it takes instead of heeding Chairman Weidmann's uh, recipes. That is um, interesting also because when you look at it strategically, what has happened over this last summer is that in my personal view, Chancellor Merkel has done, done something in a hugely elegant way. If she had made the decision that Mr. Draghi has now made, she would probably risk, as we go into our election year next year, she would probably risk losing much of her own, uh, of, her, of the support in her own group. So the elegant decision was to find a way for somebody else 
to take the necessary decisions, somebody who is not directly associ associated with the German government, and that particular person was the chairman of the European Central Bank. We have always said, have we not, that the Central Bank is independent. That has been an important principle of German monetary, uh, EU monetary policy. So no one can dare to criticize the ECB because it's independent. Um, in other words, Chancellor Merkel got the best of, of all worlds out of this. We are now taking action to make sure that there will be some degree of relief for, for the crisis, for the periphery countries in crisis. While she is not running the risk of being accused by her own supporters within her own party of uh, squandering German tax t taxpayers' money. Uh, so I think this has been underestimated by the international observers to some extent. And, and I, I'm not suggesting to you that the worst is now over. Uh, I think the worst is, is where we are, and we will probably be in it for some time. But I think this, these events of the last several months should indicate even to you, and I, I, I would imagine many of you are skeptical about this, that uh, we are not dumb, and that we know that certain things need to happen in order to prevent this thing from falling off a cliff. And it will not fall from off the cliff. Uh, Germany could never, never, never afford this politically, and certainly not economically and financially. So I am totally optimistic. Uh, my second point is very brief. Uh, my second point is, uh, you may be reading here and there that the Germans have, been, have become less enthusiastic about the uh, European Union in general and about the Eurozone in particular. I've read articles that seem to suggest that the Germans are now more interested in China than in France because we sell more products to China. Well, that's not really true. If Mr. Steinbrück, the recently nominated opposition candidate for chancellor, were to get elected a year from now, his government would probably be even more pro-European than Chancellor Merkel's government. There is no one, certainly no one, who is a serious force in German politics who is criticizing in any meaningful way Germany's commitment to the EU and to the Eurozone. Uh, there is no right-wing party like in France. Uh, there is no challenge by the opposition to Chancellor Merkel. Every single decision taken by our parliament to implement the various crises decisions over the last year or two have been voted with practically a two-thirds majority or more. This is extremely solid. And uh, you may hear a lot of grumbling. And uh, of course, people are fearful that they are losing their taxpayers' money and, and, and these, these, these tabloid arguments about, you know, why should we pay for the Greeks uh, who, whose wages have gone up 60% while ours have not gone up a, 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 even a little bit over the last number of years. These arguments exist, but they do not indicate a departure by Germany as a whole from her or its very pro-European fundamental uh, uh, direction. The one problem, to conclude this point, is the problem of leadership. We had a historic moment last December when Radek Sikorsky, known to many in this town because he, he used to live here, uh, he used to live here when I was ambassador, and we, had, we used to have wonderfully controversial arguments about the pipeline that the Poles regarded as 
absolutely not in the Polish interest, whereas the Schroeder government, of course, wanted the pipeline. And we were fighting, Radek and I, all the time. We're now very good friends, and I want to quote him here. He said in a speech, you know, remember Poland was overrun by Germany and divided and cut up and, and destroyed more than once. Um, one of the worst bilateral histories you can imagine. He said, and I quote, you have become Europe's um, indispensable nation. He was not speaking about the United States. Uh, you may not fail to lead, not dominate, but to lead in reform. I will probably be the first Polish foreign minister in history to say so, but here it is. I fear German power less than I'm beginning to fear German inactivity. That produced some headlines. Uh, it was really, I think, one of the most, for, for Germany and for, for, for the way Germans feel about, think about themselves, one of the most meaningful speeches in a long time. Um, leading for Germany is a, is a very hard thing. We always thought that the, for the Americans to lead NATO, to lead Europe, that must be so easy. You're strong, so you lead. Well, leading also means to be a little more generous than those you are leading. If you are not a bit more generous, they will not like to be led by you. That's hard for Germans to understand. We didn't want to lead. We wanted to be just good Europeans. We want, if we had to lead, we wanted to lead with France or with the others together, but certainly not in a, in a, in a visible way. So this is a hard thing for the German political elite to acquire the, the, uh, uh, a sense of responsibility and inevitability of maybe taking leadership decisions and explaining to your population that as a, uh, as a benevolent leader, I don't want to use the word hegemon, because that's not really what it is. Uh, you need to be just a bit more uh, willing to give than those that are being led. Uh, that's hard. So I, I disagree with my friend George Soros, who has said recently in, a, in an article, Germany, lead or leave. I don't think that's the, that's the option. I think we have to lead, we have to learn to lead, and leaving is not an option, absolutely not. My last point, and I'm not going, and, but I'd be delighted if you have questions. I'm not going, for reasons of time, into uh, you know the issue of Russia and Iran and Syria and the responsibility to protect and, and so on and so forth. Uh, last point I want to make is simply, um, the point about the transatlantic relationship that um, you know when when Mrs. Clinton, when Secretary Clinton and Secretary Panetta came to Munich together in um, February to make the point to the assembled uh, foreign affairs and defense leaders of Europe that the so-called pivot or the rebalancing doesn't mean that you would want to abandon Europe. On the contrary, uh, it was a strong statement. Um, I think that we Europeans need to be a lot more self-confident. Uh, we have interests in Asia, too. We don't have uh, a navy in, in Asia, but we have very, very strong interests. And I, my suggestion is, that if we want to preserve a healthy transatlantic relationship, we should start an intelligent process between the State Department and you know, Lady Ashton and other, other foreign policy leaders about how conceivably we might pivot not against each other, but maybe together. The worst outcome that I can think of, and I know that I, I just heard that Dr. Kissinger is coming to this institution uh, this week, and uh, I, I'm going to try to be there to listen to him. I have listened to his concerns about 
the U.S.-Chinese relationship in the past. And I think the worst outcome for the transatlantic relationship would be if we drifted in a situation where the U.S.-Chinese relationship were going to be dominated by military rivalry as a, as a, as a principle, whereas the Germans and the rest of Europe is making money. I don't think that that would work well for the transatlantic relationship. We would have an endless series of, 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 of hugely divisive uh, conflicts, which is why I think we need to at least start thinking about how we could coordinate and maybe develop uh, not an identical, but a coordinated approach, a policy approach to China and to the rest of Asia. The uh, president of the Commission of the European Union, uh, Barroso, gave a speech a few days ago, and I, I don't want to repeat this speech, and I, 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 I suspect that you may have heard these arguments many, many times. I, I just want to, you know, sort of highlight the, the fundamental point which Barroso made, which is a true point. Even as Germans get excited about, you know, selling so many automobiles to China, and even as you get excited <laughs> about the um, uh, strategic challenges of a rising uh, military and, and political power in China and elsewhere in Asia, let's not forget that yours, that your and our economic backbone is the transatlantic. Uh, I wrote down a number of uh, a number of things, and I'm actually not go. I, I don't want to quote all of this uh, to you, but uh, it happens to be, it happens to be true. Total U.S. investment in the EU is three times higher than in all of Asia. U.S. firms invest more in Belgium, in Belgium, than in China or in India. This is the reality. It's being widely ignored. We get so excited about these growing figures regarding other parts of the world. But the reality is that the North Atlantic, um, uh, the North Atlantic relationship is the most intense trading and investment relationship uh, between any parts of the world, and nothing is going to change that uh, any time soon. So we need each other, and I believe that we Europeans, if we manage what I believe we will be doing, if we manage to be in control of our continuing crisis sufficiently so that we can also start thinking about few, a few other things than the daily Eurozone challenges, we will continue to be your single most important partner. Because wherever the United States is challenged in, in a major way. I don't see, you know, much support from other parts of the world in Afghanistan. Where which nations did go with you? Even Germany, uh, often accused of being so reluctant to use military force, uh, even Germany, uh, you know, went forward. Chancellor Schroeder, I remember it well, called me when I served here as ambassador in November of 2001. He said, do you think at the White House they understood what I just did today? And I said, what did you do? Because I hadn't really followed the radio. Uh, <laughs> so, and he said, well, I risked my job because I, 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 I raised, I asked the vote, uh, question of confidence. Um, and according to our parliamentary procedures, if that vote hadn't been positive, he would have been out of a job automatically that morning. So I said, okay, now I understand. And uh, when he came to Washington four weeks later, I had done a bit of lobbying with the NSC and others, and to my great joy, uh, President Bush uh, welcomed Chancellor Schroeder, this was in January of 2002, and said, Gerhard, you did a great thing back then in November. That was a courageous thing for you to do, and Schroeder was so happy. Those were the, those were, this is 10 years ago. Those were 
actually uh, good days, and let's not forget them. We Europeans will probably always be difficult partners, sometimes reluctant partners, but we're still your best partners. And now I look forward to a good discussion with you. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Shall I do this from here? Or from no, here? you can. Sit okay, down. I'll sit down. Thank you so much for your remarks, Ambassador Shingo. We now have about 20 minutes for Q and A. If uh, uh, if you'd like to uh, pose a question, please wait for the microphone and identify yourself, please. We'll go up to this gentleman first. <coughs> I prepared my question while you're speaking, Mr. Ambassador. Probably the Europeans here, not probably, they do have economic problems. Every country that was given, was accepted in the European Union, were given a number of billions to develop industry. However, they would be benefited most if they were based on investments, on alliances, partnerships and joint ven ventures among the Europeans. The money was given to the politicians, and probably it was wasted. My question is, are you doing something similar to what the Bank of Boston did, a study titled MIT? The impact of innovation among the conclusions was MIT graduate founded 4,000 companies created 1,100,000 jobs, generated $232 billion. See what happens if money is given to the right people? Capitalism in its majesty and grandeur. Your comment, sir. <laughs> yeah. Do it's I? On. It's, it's on. on. Mm -hmm. It's on. Well, I'm not going to have an argument with you. Uh, um, you make an important point. Uh, efforts in the EU to uh, promote uh, innovation, to promote venture capital type uh, activities have been undertaken a uh, uh, number of times. <coughs> they have not been exceedingly successful for uh, a number of reasons. And of course, in the current climate, where, where, where European banks are not only um, you know, an industry with a terrible reputation, but also a, an industry that continues to be slightly dysfunctional because the interbank situation isn't working well, I suppose we need to wait a little a little bit until there can be um, justified hope and a justified effort to produce more uh, more innovation in Europe. That this is needed is absolutely correct. Uh, I wrote a piece a year ago, uh, a brief uh, op-ed in a in a German journal, and I I, I argued. You know, why are we so in love with the status quo? Uh, the German constitution, post-war, post-World War II, was a non-status quo constitution because it, it was built on the assumption that at some point we might reacquire unification. So it was against the status quo. But interestingly, interestingly enough, the moment we had achieved this particular objective, the Germans, in my analysis, fell in love with what has now been achieved and stopped thinking about changing anything. We have had so much change, they've been arguing, now leave us alone, no, no more change. In love with the status quo. That's a real problem, and if you propose in the German um, situation, if you, if you raise, for example, the question, is it a law of nature that the United States, which has maybe two-thirds or so of the population of the EU, produces continuously 
each year uh, significantly more Nobel Prize winners than Europe? Uh, are we simply less intelligent than the Americans, or are we not simply not doing the same good education and university uh, and, and research job, et cetera, et cetera? I suppose it is the latter. So if humans are responsible for the educational system, then humans can change it. Can we change it? We should change it in, 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 in the direction of more, innova more innovation, uh, less uh, love of the status quo. But um, that's, that's a huge task for the future. And I, again, I agree with you. Thank you. Thank you. Sam Wells. Wolfgang, let's return to the Eurozone, if we could, for a moment. Um, in today's U.S. edition of the Financial Times, uh, Wolfgang Munchau, who's uh, certainly not often an optimist these past few months, uh, says that he thinks the powers that be in German, the German political class are decidedly against a banking union, that they have defined the agreement made over the summer in terms that will not allow the kind of banking union that the Spanish and the Italians had expected to go into play, and that uh, there will be some terrible uh, discussions coming up to try and clarify what is a misunderstanding of what the proposed banking union and uh, common supervision through the ECB is likely to mean. Uh, is he talking to completely different people than you are, or how does he come to that conclusion? Well, well, well. <laughs> um, let me try to offer a, 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 a brief answer to that. Um, I, I read uh, Munchau's piece, uh, but, you know, if you have followed his line of argument, the Eurozone should have should have collapsed a long time ago. He predicted, he's one of those who have, who's been continuously predicting that we're e everything that we're doing, we're doing wrong, and this will uh, collapse. Um, we are engaged in very, very difficult discussions. And even Wolfgang Munchau doesn't know how to move beyond the dilemma, which is the, the central dilemma the with which the Eurozone, and in particular Germany as the potential donor country, the lender country, is. We believe, um, I mean, what, who is we? I mean, mainstream German political leaders believe that if we create a situation that takes away the pain, the pain of adjustment in the periphery countries, all hope will be lost that these countries will ever move into better health. Nothing will happen without pain. Uh, and I think that's correct. The question is how much pain is too much pain. Um, and I think we probably um, ask a, a little too much. This is my private view. We've been asking a little too much of our Greek uh, friends. I, I believe that if we, had, if we had to install the same measures re in relative terms in Germany, we would have some kind of revolution ourselves. It's, it's, it's very hard to imagine. Um, these types of austerity measures. But a little bit of pain is necessary, and this is exactly the moral hazard dilemma. Um, how far should we go in relieving the pressure on the periphery countries right now? If we are too magnanimous, uh, if we throw too much money at them, uh, they will immediately say, enough is enough. You can see it in how the Spanish political scene behaves, in how Mario Montes, even his best supporters behave. Uh, after the Draghi decision, 
The first thing that happened was in some of the peripheral countries, the idea was, <coughs> all right, finally, now let's go on vacation, uh, which is, of course, exactly wrong. Uh, so, sorry to say, uh, the Minshaw analysis may not be wrong, but I, I don't know what a better recipe would be uh, than to demand uh, continuing efforts by the periphery countries, and with specifically with regard uh, to banking, to the banking union idea. I mean, there are different views of what the banking union should produce. We believe a banking, uh, the Germans believe a banking union, you know, is a banking union for the future. It should create the same rules and create uh, a level playing field and uh, create one single supervisor uh, so we will not have these criminal deviations from uh, rules and regulations. Whereas uh, in some of the periphery countries, and in, in that sense, Munchau has a point, of course, the idea of a banking union is somebody is going to take care of our debt. That is not exactly what was agreed in way back at the end of July. Uh, so we will have a continuing fight, uh, and that's normal. Look, I mean, on all these, as I said in the beginning, on all of these crises in the EU, we have had terrible fights. It, the, EU, the EU has never been a peaceful, you know, uh, a class of girls uh, singing songs. It's always been about money. And I remember, you know, even before Mr. Rajoy, former uh, Spanish prime ministers, used to come to the sessions in Brussels with the only express wish to extract a little more money from Helmut Kohl. That was normal. That was the way things, things worked. Uh, and these were always tough fights. They are particularly tough because it is now about you know, life or death of the system, so it's even more serious, but it's, not, uh, it's nothing new. So I don't get excited about the Munchau peace, and we will um, continue to struggle. Thank you. There's a question in the center, the gentleman in the center. No? Then the lady in the, st you had a question as well. Yep, right next to him. Yep. Thank you. My name is Magdalena Luminska, and I'm a Fulbright Fellow at the Center for Transatlantic Relations at Johns Hopkins University. And I'm wondering, what would you say to all the critics that say and repeat over and over that uh, the European Union is too preoccupied with its internal problems to be able to play any role on an, on an international scene right now? And by the way, I'm Polish, and I remember that the Sikorsky speech that you mentioned actually did make quite headlines in Poland, too. I imagine it, yeah. it did, as it, as it should have. I would say that, that you are right. I would say this is a, 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 a highly justified criticism of the EU. We have been too preoccupied. We have not uh, been able to get our act together in a number of areas, um, including, for example, just to give you an example, uh, the area of, of defense. I mean, you know, take a, think about it for a moment. Here are 27 countries, 17 of which are united in the Eurozone. And uh, then take a look at, for example, uh, speaking of Poland, take a look at the Baltic Sea. With the exception of Russia, all countries, you know, adjacent to the Baltic Sea happen to be members of the European Union. Norway isn't really on the Baltic. Norway is more, as a NATO member, more on the Atlantic side. So there are seven or eight countries, three Baltic states, Poland, Denmark, Germany, uh, Finland, Sweden. Um, how many navies do they operate? Do they operate one navy? as one European Union? No. 
each of these countries, most of them tiny countries with five million or, or fewer inhabitants, they have navies with more admirals than ships. Uh, they have, you know, totally wasteful expenditure because they have their own naval academy, uh, you know, with maybe 50 students or so. It, the, you can make one huge argument, uh, not only with respect to the Baltic Sea, that it would make eminent sense to have one you know, combined naval effort in the Baltic Sea. There's actually no big outside threat anymore, so this is about preventing crime, controlling uh, environmental waste, making sure the sea lanes are uh, uh, protected, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 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 there are no, no major military threats anymore in the Baltic. Uh, have we made much progress in this direction? Zero. Well, maybe not zero, but close to zero. In other words, there is a huge area in the area of training, equipment, and even doctrine among these 27 countries in the military area where we could, in my estimation, create huge synergy effects and at least make sure that as defense budgets go down, look at what has happened in Britain with a two-digit decline in the defense budget. Uh, you know, uh, Germany as a not very well respected military participant, quote unquote, l remember Libya, Germany will turn out to be one of the few countries in the EU where the defense budget will be more or less stable. But in most countries, defense budgets go down. So the question is, can we create a situation where as defense budgets decrease, military uh, effectiveness, military Kampfkraft, uh, capability will at least remain at present levels, maybe even increase a bit, uh, as seen from, from Washington, D.C., where former secretaries of defense and probably even also current secretary, s secretaries of defense have correctly uh, analyzed the situation as one where Europe is slowly disappearing from the American radar screen for lack of capability. But I believe that we could do immensely more by doing what we have done in trade and in so many other areas by applying these principles to the military. Do you know why it's not happening? Because every admiral wants to keep his ships. Uh, and it is exactly like in the area of the single currency. The idea of the single currency was, believe me, not born in any of the finance ministries of the EU. If you had left it to the finance ministries, we would have the lira and the French franc and the German mark uh, to this day. So the innovative ideas in this particular case usually need to come from the top. And that is why I believe that at some point in the near future, we need a strong push from the top to do something about military effectiveness, about pooling and sharing, about getting rid of hugely wasteful uh, duplication in the EU. Sorry for a long speech, but this is uh, something that's uh, where I feel very strongly. Okay, we're running quickly running out, out of time. time, so let me call on three final speaker. Uh, the gentleman uh, there, and then uh, we'll, we'll take all of you uh, at once, and then we'll okay. give Ambassador Ishinga one final opportunity to respond. Okay. Brief questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm the uh, Fulbright Visiting Chair in Canada-U.S. Relations here at the Wilson Center uh, from Dalhousie University in Canada. I okay. just wanted to say that we had the pleasure of welcoming uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel just days before we left, and this was the only university in Canada that she visited during her trip to Ottawa. Yes. My question uh, to you, Mr. Ambassador, is rather more structural than it is of the cyclical kind of conversation that seems to, uh, that we mostly engage in on a daily basis. It's not about the, 50% youth unemployment in Greece or Spain. It's not about, you know, the, uh, the difficulties with the banking union, mm. uh, the uh, difficulty with uh, uh, having a monetary uh, union without, you know, common, 
you know, without fiscal uh, measures in place. It is more structural, and it is one that is rather more fundamental in nature, that uh, the Eurozone consists of two very different cultures, economic cultures, whereby you have the northern European countries with very different tax regimes, with very different uh, compliance systems in place, and the southern European countries, uh, where the tax regimes, where compliance measures and so forth are rather more different, structurally different, uh, fundamentally different, as opposed to any cyclical turbulence that we have over the course of the business cycle. Your My question, question sir, mm -hmm. is do you think that the Eurozone can overcome these very basic um, economic cultures, one in the south and one in the north, that, are, that seem to be at odds. Thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Could you pass, pass the microphone to the gentleman up front here? Yep, you. Yep. Yes. Good to see you again, sir. Mike Mosetic from PBS Online NewsHour. Your comments about Europeans getting more involved in China and Asia are really quite intriguing. Um, I was wondering if you, particularly also in view that uh, the Chinese if uh, have, in terms of their historical context, look at Europe no more favorably than they look at the United States in terms of the past few hundred years. Uh, if you could elaborate perhaps a bit more on what kind of ideas are being generated in Europe uh, to get more actively involved in the kind of things that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then if you could pass this to the ambassador across the table. Yep. Thank you so much. I'm uh, the ambassador of Romania. Uh, ich möchte mich uh, bei Ihnen, Herr Botschafter, ganz herzlich bedanken für Ihre Darstellung. Thank you so much for your presentation. And um, I'd like to uh, tell you that um, I, uh, I think I have agreed with uh, almost everything what you have uh, uh, said here. And uh, uh, I'd like to echo here the, uh, the spirit of uh, keeping uh, the euro and the Eurozone, uh, Romania, my country. And I think we are still rational when we uh, think that we will join the Eurozone. At least this is the desire mm -hmm. of, uh, of uh, my government. Um, but if you agree that uh, what um, doesn't kill us makes us stronger, then um, I'd like to ask you uh, there is in the Wall Street Journal of today, there is an article regarding uh, the, the global uh, scene and uh, with the uh, um, slow uh, increase in the GDP in the United States and uh, the decline maybe uh, or uh, the weakening of the growth in China, how is Europe reacting uh, to this? and? Um, uh, what are the chances not to stay in the recession because of this uh, global economic uh, environment? And Ambassador, just one small um, request. Please be positive in your answer because I'm going to, s to put it in the cable to Bucharest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yes. OK. Yes. Uh, we, we, I, I am aware that of the fact that we've already gone beyond the allotted time, so I, I need to be brief, and I apologize for uh, answers which may not be entirely satisfactory. Um, on the first question, I think I interpret your question as a question, it, wouldn't it be better to have a Eurozone North and a Eurozone South than to continue to try to continue this struggle to uh, combine two different cultures? I don't really agree with the premise. Uh, I believe it is true that we have had a serious, how shall I put it, without being impolite, failure to implement agreed principles of accounting, et cetera, et cetera, in one country. That was Greece, where simply the books were being, as everybody now knows, were being cooked for years and years and years. Too bad for the Greeks, because they are now paying for that dearly, which is really too bad. Uh, but I don't believe for a minute that 
a very rich country like Italy can't perform, you know, if, it's, if it is led by a responsible government, which is now the case, uh, can't perform up to par with France, Germany, and Holland, et cetera. Why not? I mean, Italy, Italy is a rich country. If uh, uh, Italy is not internationally much in debt, if uh, the, all the rich Italians chimed in, Italy could save itself without going to any international bank. So there are also, uh, as you said, there are differences between North and South, but there are also differences between each of these individual nations, and the reasons why some of them are now in crisis are to some extent very different from the reasons why others are in crisis. Spain is in crisis for very different reasons than Greece or Ireland, etc. So no, I don't agree. I think we can continue to have one Eurozone with difficulty and with some degree of transfer that's going to have to happen, even if my fellow Germans get all nervous about it, uh, there has got to be some transfer. Germans are beginning now to understand that we are actually saving a lot of money because of the crisis, because, you know, if you buy a house in Germany uh, now, you pay zero uh, interest, practically. In other words, everything has become really cheap, and uh, that is owed to the crisis, whereas the Greeks and others have to pay um, uh, a lot of interest. So I think Germans are beginning to understand that as we benefit from the crisis, we need to, uh, be to open our wallet a little more. Uh, that will be painful also, but it will happen. Second question, China. Um, sorry to say uh, that uh, efforts to come up with a unified China strategy of the European Union have at least in my analysis, not been, uh, you know, brilliant. We continue to disagree uh, on the question of what should we do with the uh, arms embargo, which has now existed for more than a decade. Uh, Germany has a very, very close relationship with China now. Remember, Chancellor Merkel went with seven or eight cabinet members to China, and this is now a new tradition where the Chinese government and the German government meet in, um, in, 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 a, in a configuration that is surprisingly intense. Um, China has this kind of relationship only with Germany, to my knowledge. Uh, other Europeans don't have the same intense relationship. Why? Because we sell all these automobiles and other things in China. We have become important to China. Um, I believe that it will be even more important to develop a coherent, agreed China strategy of the European Union. I also believe that it is wrong if individual European countries start bilateralizing their economic and political relationships. In, in the case of my own country, I don't want to criticize my own country here uh, while sitting here in Washington, but just to give you an example, uh, we have started a bilateral relationship with Mongolia, um, trying to exploit Mongolian resources. I believe it would be much better if Germany pro proposed that this agreement be signed by the EU and Mongolia rather than Germany and Mongolia. Yeah, I think that would make a lot more sense thinking of the future. Uh, temptations are great and we need to fight it and we need to talk about it. And finally, on the question of uh, asked by the Romanian ambassador, I am sorry I don't have a good answer, but I will uh, uh, do you the favor and tell you that I think that we will move out of the re recession if we can do what we have now promised to do, namely add 
a serious growth program to the obviously required austerity program, and if we can put a premium on innovation. And finally, finally, my last remark addressed to you, sir, from Romania. What the EU also needs to do, led by major players like France, UK, Germany, and, and others, is to make sure that we resolve the remaining political, strategic, and economic crises spots within our own um, system. I'm speaking of southeastern Europe. It is not good. It is not okay. It is, I shouldn't say a shame, but it is regrettable that in 2012, we don't have a fully resolved Kosovo situation. It's too bad. It's still like a sore wound. It is too bad. I was in Bosnia-Herzegovina just 10 days ago. It's too bad that there continues to be a state, uh, to exist a state which is in more ways than one practically dysfunctional. That's what we need to demonstrate, that we as Europeans can handle these situations before we go off to Afghanistan and Jerusalem and, and the Horn of Africa. We need to make sure that we pay attention to, to this. And your own country and the other EU members in the region, I think, should at each and every meeting in Brussels uh, say what, uh, what was his name, uh, the, the senator in old Rome, Ceterum Censio, you know, Ceterum Censio, Carthaginem esse Lendam. Uh, you should be, uh, you know, challenging the rest of the EU to make sure that the crisis spots in southeastern Europe be finally overcome, that money be thrown at the uh, unemployment situation in places like Kosovo and, and others. That would be a demonstration of the will of the EU to uh, move into innovation, to move into a coherent a more coherent social, political, and economic uh, future, and to overcome the crisis. And even Mr. Munchau will then probably write more friendly articles. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us at the Wilson Center. We're all indebted to Ambassador Ishinga for some extra time to answer your questions. You saw there's a huge amount of interest. So thanks. We hope to see you again at a Wilson Center event soon. Thank you. <laughs>